Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a zone of peace in the Americas and events in Uganda and presidential indictments and everything we can find time for with Margaret Kimberly, who is executive editor and senior columnist at Black Agenda Report, a member of the coordinating committee of Black Alliance for Peace and the author of a wonderful book previously discussed on this show called Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents. Margaret Kimberly, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thanks, it's good to be back. Thanks for coming on. Uh, So this zone of peace, I'm afraid uh, some people live in it or near it and don't know what it is. The, The community of Latin American and Caribbean States over 30 countries declared something back in 2014. Uh, what what did this mean? What does it mean? Well, uh, CELAC, um, the uh, Organization of uh, Countries in the Caribbean and Latin America, and CELAC was formed to try to counter the impact of the OAS, the Organization of American States, which is just an American puppet. Uh, doesn't serve the needs of the people, acts on behalf of the U.S., uh, it's hostile to anyone. The, uh, the OAS is in Washington, so hello. Uh, at any rate, so CELAC was formed, <clears throat> excuse me, as an alternative uh, for countries in the region to be able to act independently, to talk independently. And in 2014, at their meeting in Havana, Cuba, they declared that um, uh, the hemisphere should be a zone of peace, meaning free from militarism, free from inter from guess who, from, from the US, uh, a place where rights were respected, sovereignty of nations would be uh, uh, respected, and uh, where resources would be used for the benefit of the people. All these things that are, uh, are very good and, and wonderful, uh, but um, at Black Alliance for Peace, we realize it's not enough for states to make these declarations. There has to be a way for uh, people, for grassroots organizations uh, to come together uh, on this or any other issues. So we, uh, two weeks ago, uh, declared a, um, uh, uh, began our Zone of Peace campaign. Uh, and uh, there were simultaneous announcements in in Washington, in Haiti, uh, with a group called uh, Molagafa. Um, I don't ask me what the acronym stands for. It's in Haitian Creole. But anyway, it's a grassroots organization uh, fighting the constant fight that Haiti has to be free from uh, foreign domination. Uh, we had some folks in Cuba at that time. And there are organizations in other countries which are also part of uh, this Zone of Peace campaign. But uh, the Zone of Peace commits these countries to numerous things, right? No wars, no nuclear weapons, working for disarmament, settling disputes peacefully. Uh, You're asking the United States to behave in that manner? Uh, Well... I, I don't think there's any uh, expectation of the United States doing any of those things. The fact that there was this need to have this declaration in the first place uh, uh, tells us that the U.S. is the problem. So, um, But there has to be a sustained campaign against what the U.S. does all the time. So, for example, the South American nation of Colombia is a member of NATO, some sort of special designation which I thought NATO was a North Atlantic treaty organization, but I guess they claim the whole world, right? Uh, So uh, there, and there are military bases, as you know, all over the world, some 800 uh, US and NATO bases, some of them in the uh, uh, Americas. Uh, There's uh, these these, uh, uh, army, these military command structures, AFRICOM, Indo-PACCOM, of course, there's a SOUTHCOM. Uh, and these are means for the U.S. to interfere uh, with other countries. So what we want is for people to hear in the U.S. to know what their country is doing um, that's so damaging to other nations in the most extreme forms. We see the terrible sanctions imposed on Cuba 
for example, in uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua, Nicaragua, we see U.S. interventions. We see the U.S. kidnapping the uh, president of Haiti and the U.N. The U.N., by the way, is not always the people think of it as this beneficial organization, but they take part in uh, some of this interference. So uh, especially, and this is the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, so it's important, too, to talk about real independence, real sovereignty, um, nations being able to work, to even if they have conflicts with one another, being able to resolve them peacefully so that, for example, you had uh, the Dominican Republic uh, offer to hold talks between the Venezuelan government and opposition, and the U.S. scuttles the talks. Uh, that sort, that's the sort of thing that um, the zone of peace is opposing. And, and you have a list of demands, I think, that would include shutting down Southcom and getting rid of bases and all the training and weaponization, right? Yeah, well, Black Allies for Peace is a, a member of the No Foreign Bases Coalition. So absolutely, we want uh, all these command structures need to go. There should not be an AFRICOM or an Indo-PACCOM or a Southcom. Uh, the, uh, you know, in the current... Um, uh, Southcom commander, she's very open. Oh yes, well we have lithium in the Americas. We have this, we have that, and this is so important. In other words, for the U.S. to control these resources, instead of them being controlled by people themselves, which means having governments that are truly sovereign, and that means uh, uh, Yankees go home. In short, my uh, my neighbor here in Charlottesville, James Monroe, gave that speech, uh, as you say, 200 years ago, come this winter, that where he said those words that people would later call the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, how How is the Monroe Doctrine doing after 200 years? Most things don't last that long. Well, U.S. imperialism lives on, so the Monroe Doctrine lives on. And people actually, you know, will, will talk about it without any irony or anything. Well, the Monroe Doctrine says we can tell this or that country what to do is openly discussed during the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, or other other times that uh, this is uh, the whole hemisphere is America's backyard, as uh, they say, and Joe Biden, being Joe Biden, of course, he thinks he's giving a compliment, and he says, no, it's America's front yard. <laughs> well, dude, it's not anybody's yard. Um, uh, these are nations which should be free to make their own decisions um, uh, about their futures. And uh, people in these countries should be able to work for what they want without any uh, fear of uh, uh, US interference. I mean, there's no need for an OAS in Washington or for the US to claim this right to sanction uh, countries that it has declared as enemies. So uh, this is why um, the organization CELAC is important and why the zone of peace campaign is so important. Of course, the, the Trumpies talked openly in support of the Monroe Doctrine and the Biden gang doesn't, but I'm not sure the behavior is as different as the rhetoric. Uh, but but well, what do you make of that? And, and what can people do to help uh, who want to expand this campaign for a zone of peace? Well, you know, when there were changes, uh, uh, Obama, who I was no fan of, he did, however, normalize relations with Cuba, reestablish diplomatic relations, uh, congressional legislation uh, prevented, assuming he wanted to, get rid of sanctions altogether, but there were improvements in uh, U.S.-Cuba relations. Trump reversed uh, almost all of that, brought back some of the harshest sanctions, and Biden followed Trump. Um, uh, and he lied. During this campaign, he said he would stick with the, uh, uh, the Obama initiatives, and he didn't. So I think it's important for people to pay attention to what these people do, to know that um, these imperatives are deeply embedded in the political structure of the country, but to speak up anyway. Uh, there was recently a, a call-in and write-in campaign for the U.S. to end sanctions against Cuba. And this is, uh, these issues are issues you can vote on. You know, peace should be an election issue and people shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't allow them uh, peace to be relegated to um, 
some sort of irrelevancy. So I, you know, you can always call your representatives, you can always write them, and you can be serious about it. And uh, but if you say something and then you vote for people who do these things, you've undercut yourself and undercut these principles uh, that uh, uh, people claim to uh, believe in. So in case you can't tell, I'm a person who is a, a, an exeter from the Democratic Party. I personally am a Green, but I advocate for people not to be afraid to vote on the basis of these issues. Isn't it interesting, Margaret, that when the Trump gang undid the progress of the Obama gang on Cuba, one of the big arguments was this horrific attack by some unknown foreign demon with uh, a new sort of weapon that created the Havana syndrome. Yeah. Uh, and most recently, more or less, most of the secret illegal agencies of the US government have said, well, actually, no, we don't think anybody created anything. Uh, it's a collection of weird symptoms and it's not a new disease. And if, uh, and meanwhile, others suspect that it was the CIA itself. In any case, they're now experimenting on animals with how, with how to create such a weapon, whether anybody else has it or not, uh, which may have been the, the, the dream in the first place. But the, the, clearly the Biden administration has not shut down that propaganda that came up during the Trump administration. What what do you, maybe they've all got the Havana syndrome. What do you- Well, they, they have had a Havana syndrome. It's not this uh, strange uh, disease. And someone said it was caused by crickets. I mean, it is uh, it is the strange, well, it's not really strange. It's had an audio would... tape and somebody listened to it and said it was crickets. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, what, what else can one expect? Uh, the U.S. has decided to make this country an enemy for more than 60 years. Because they dared, they dared to have a revolution and to really mean it. So the sanctions now that um, uh, Biden has brought back are actually worse than what Trump was doing. So, uh, you know, you have to oppose the whole thing. You can't, re you know, reform around the edges just a little bit. Um, you have to really mean it, uh, as we do as, at the Black Alliance for Peace when we declared the Zone of Peace on April 4th, our anniversary, um, uh, the anniversary of uh, Dr. King um, announcing his opposition to the war and of his assassination, by the way, such a special date. But um, uh, yeah, this is, this is something that has to be uh, ongoing, and you can't... I wanted to say this other thing. You know, they they know that they can't be truthful. They can't just say uh, U.S. imperialism demands that this country be punished for being so close to the U.S. and daring to have a socialist revolution. So there's always some kind of they get buy in with, about human rights or or something. They always think of something. But I, I believe the enemy is imperialism. And you can't have peace unless you're anti-imperialist. It's very important uh, to claim that um, as a, um, a, a means of uh, mobilizing and operating and, and making choices, electoral choices and so forth. So that's the problem. The problem is uh, Yankee imperialism, as they say. We are speaking with Margaret Kimberly, who, among other things, is executive editor and senior columnist at Black Agenda Report. One of the other topics you've been writing about recently is Uganda. What is happening over there? Well, Uganda was, uh, African countries generally are not in the news, um, but uh, recently there was a, um, their parliament passed a bill making um, an LG, anti-LGBTQ bill making it illegal to even um, uh, for, for people to identify as LGBT, uh, uh, jail sentences, uh, even life in prison. It's horrible. It's a, it's a horrible thing. But I wrote about the fact that Uganda's worst crimes are carried out on behalf of the United States. Uganda is, gets millions of dollars in military and other aid, and Uganda and its neighbor Rwanda regularly pillage the Eastern Congo, um, the worst part of uh, the war there in the early O's. Uh, it, there was more than 6 million people died 
they um, have formed this uh, militia M23, uh, Rwanda and Uganda together. Um, that portion of Congo is rich in everything we use, coltan, cobalt, gold, diamonds. You, uh, Congo uh, has, has it all. And Uganda regularly keeps the country destabilized because the U.S. and European countries want to make sure uh, that their resources are secure. That is to say, they get them for next to nothing. Uh, people may have seen, and if you haven't, you should look up artisanal mining. I mean, it sounds very, you know, like a benevolent thing, but people in uh, Congo and other, around the world mine with their hands, with sticks, with shovels, uh, all of these precious minerals and resources that make other people rich. And this happens in um, uh, Congo. There was a recent viral video of uh, people using their hands to dig people out who were trapped in a, a mine collapse. There's no safety. Uh, and these mines are owned by US corporations, Canadian, European, Chinese corporations. Um, and that's the way they want it. They want people to work for in dangerous conditions for pennies a day but make sure that they get their money. And Uganda plays a role in keeping Congo destabilized uh, and in people dying, horrific uh, war crimes going on for years. So while I, I felt it was important uh, for people to, um, to talk about this anti-LGBTQ law, but to also know about the crimes the Ugandan government commits on behalf of the United States. I couldn't agree more, but I had not heard this one before. So if you mine without big machinery, if you get poor people to do it with their hands, you call it artisanal mining? Yes, I know. It sounds like, you know, a new kind of uh, break, baked wheat bread or something, but that is what it is called. I don't know who came up with this term. Well, they it's... got paid big bucks, whoever came up with that term, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be nice if something like the the most deadly war, at least since Vietnam, were known and talked about in U.S. media. Uh, not that these these horrific laws uh, against LGBTQ people, some of these countries uh, putting in place the death penalty. Um, yeah. You know, if the wars were also news, as well as if the, the, the British and colonial origins of these anti-gay laws in Africa were part of the story. Yeah, it's like there are these evangel U.S. evangelical groups, mostly, who have a big influence in Ugandan society. And they are also behind. So it's important to know uh, to know that. But, um, you know, the, the media, our politicians do a terrible job of keeping us informed uh, about the full scale of U.S. involvements uh, around the world. And you, as I said, Uganda gets a lot of military aid from the U.S. That means Congress approves of it. So, um, uh, but that's a, a very, um, it's a huge problem. And of course, it's tied to AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command. We were just talking about these military command uh, structures. Uh, Black Alliance for Peace, we've done a lot of work, uh, shut down AFRICOM, U.S. out of Africa. Um, but uh, And that's where Uganda also plays a role. So I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's something unless you, like with many other issues, unless it's something that you're specifically interested in and you know where to seek out the information, you have no idea what is going on. And that is... Uh, um, uh, the the our corporate media, which they basically follow the state, right? So if the U.S. government has decided, and it's always bipartisan, Democrats, Republicans, that Uganda is uh, going to be this client state of the U.S. and get millions of dollars, then the New York Times and NPR and Washington Post aren't going to tell you about it. Exactly. Uh, Margaret Kimberly, you've also been writing about presidential indictments. Um, and 
I suspect you agree with me about Trump, and I don't know about Putin, but my view of Trump is here's a guy who threatens war, wages war, bombs mm -hmm. people, puts children in cages, profits from public office, uh, commits all sorts of horrors, incites violence at his rallies, uh, and they indict him for a hush payment that would have been perfectly legal if his lawyer wasn't an idiot. Vladimir <laughs> Putin invades a neighboring country, bombs houses, kills families in large numbers, and they indict him for kidnapping on quite dubious evidence rather than for war. Uh, I would like both of these people and a lot of other famous people and everybody in that book you wrote indicted, but uh, aren't they kind of going after the wrong things? Well, of course they are. I mean, and let's talk about the the international criminal court which is just a joke it really is it's uh um they've only who does who do they indict mostly africans and a few serbs after uh the us and and europe uh destroyed yugoslavia that's a another it story was a separate tribunal i think it's i think it's 100% africans it's uh, well yes absolutely since then yes it's only been africans you're correct um the U.S. is very hostile to the ICC, did not, and Russia has not either, did not sign the treaty which brought it into being. Not only that, the U.S. Congress did one better, and they passed a law saying that U.S. citizens cannot be turned over to the ICC, and should they fall into the clutches of the ICC, the U.S. has the right to go to The Hague, to the Netherlands, and bust them out of jail. Uh, every U.S. president can be or should be indicted for war crimes. I mean, let's just talk about the living presidents. George W. Bush uh, invading Iraq, Obama destroying Libya, uh, uh, Trump, uh, his sanctions uh, against Venezuela killed 40,000 people, his bombings of, uh, of Syria. And Biden continues all of these things but none of them will ever be called to account for the war crimes that they all committed. And as you were saying with Trump, he's now been indicted for what I think is that the goal is, and I think it's a misguided one, to keep him from running for president again. And so, as you said, he, he had paid money to keep his private life private. And if he'd had a better lawyer, there wouldn't have been anything wrong with it. In fact, um, in order to try to make what uh, in New York State is um, generally a misdemeanor, the prosecutor said, well, it's really a felony because it's a violation of campaign finance laws. Although the FEC looked at with the federal election, the Justice Department looked at the uh, Federal Election Commission rules and said he had not. So they say, well, he was trying to evade paying taxes. He did this, he did that. So it's, a, in my opinion, the worst of what prosecutors do on a regular basis uh, in this country, overcharge, um, uh, uh, shall I say trumped up charges, um, so, so often in this country, uh, I don't care that, that Donald Trump paid people to keep silent about his affairs. I don't care. I don't think anybody else does either. But... Um, and it's not going to keep him from running again. But it really uh, bothers me that the real crimes that he and other presidents committed, they have committed with impunity. They, have, they won't get a slap on the wrist, get yelled at, told to take a time out, nothing for uh, the crimes that uh, they commit, that the United States committed, or that they have proxies commit in the name of the U.S. So the United States wants uh, Putin indicted, but doesn't want to support the court uh, that could indict him. And Putin wants the United States indicted for blowing up pipelines, but doesn't want to support the court that could indict the United. If one of these countries were to say, okay, we will make our people susceptible to the rule of law in order to make your people, you know, but since neither one of them will do it, is there, as we started out talking about the, the, the organization of the, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, is there a path by which the global South and the world outside of the United States and Russia could say, we're gonna hold both of you accountable 
uh, outside of the UN because the UN isn't working. Well, the UN, my one of my dreams in life is for the U United Nations to move outside of the United States for global South nations uh, uh, to form another entity, just as CELAC was uh, uh, formed uh, in uh, opposition to the OAS. The UN is, um, it, it's just not not working. I'll I'll just sum it up that way. It's one of the entities that's used a core group to. Um, uh, deprive people in Haiti of their democratic rights to choose a prime minister. They don't even have, and call him the uh, elected leader, which he's not. That's a longer story. But uh, uh, the United Nations uh, does not do what it what people think it does and what it should do. The Security Council apparatus needs to be changed in some way. You have these blocks: U.S., France, U.K. Russia, China, on the other, they can all veto. Uh, they all have the ability to veto. It's all based on something that happened in 1945. Uh, so other countries are um, are really cut out of the decision making uh, uh, processes. But as far as these um, uh, war crimes allegations, you know, they the the U.S. At the reason they they only said that Putin had kidnapped children, which, as you said, is dubious, is that the United States didn't want to say that he had committed a crime that they had committed themselves. Right. So you can't, you know, invade Iraq. You can't have U.S. troops in Syria when the Syrians want them out, have U.S. troops still in Iraq when Iraq wants them out, and then say, oh, Putin is a criminal because he invaded Ukraine. So they had to come up with something. And the timing was interesting, at the very least. Um, the timing coincided with Xi Jinping's meeting with Putin. Uh, they met over several days. And the issue, um, well, their, their reason, I believe, for doing it at that time was to delegitimize what Russia and China are doing now, which is forming another bloc. Uh, talking about de-dollarizing, not using the dollar as the world's currency. Um, as they said, as they parted, we're going to, I, I think she said to Putin, we're going to change, I'm paraphrasing and I'm messing it up, uh, we're going to change the world and, you know, things will, and more than the world has been changed in the past hundred years, something, I hope you can paraphrase better than I did, but they are, um, and it's a good thing you know, the problems we've been talking about are caused by U.S. hegemony and the U.S. determination to have domination over the entire world has created uh, human uh, rights violations. Uh, Ukraine, this Biden administration obsession with Ukraine, uh, they, they and they did it. They blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, but they thought they were going to sanction Russia and Russia's economy would collapse, which did not happen, by the way. Uh, so countries are skirting the sanctions regime. All sorts of things are happening outside of U.S. control, which I think uh, overall is a good thing. Uh, so they, at that moment, when uh, China and Russia were going to make these things official, they suddenly said, well, we, a year later, we have to, you know, indict Putin for something. And they came up with the, you know, the silliest thing possible. So it's all a joke. It um, uh, doesn't have any legitimacy. And it doesn't stop this, uh, the momentum of this new dynamic where President Lula of Brazil was just in China. Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron was just in China. Uh, and uh, so things have changed. Things have changed for the better. And, and just to sum up, the, the only thing the U.S. can do is peacefully coexist with the rest of the world. There's no domination anymore. Uh, they've been trying to do this since the Soviet Union uh, fell, but there's a multipolar world. And the only solution is for the U.S. to accept that fact and work with other nations. Wouldn't that be nice? Margaret, Kimberly, thank you very, <laughs> very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. 
Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.